Hello. Welcome to your tasting. I hate to, to be here. To be. And um, so, and welcome everyone uh, to the promontory tasting. And we have uh, Will Harlan tonight from uh, Napa Valley. It's 11 o'clock. Thanks for staying up. Uh, but this is going to be a great tasting. And uh, Will's going to take us through uh, the vintages today and talk about this really unique uh, terroir, this unique place, which you can see in the photos, which is I've been there a couple of times myself and walked the vineyards. Uh, and it's a really amazing, just rugged place and very uh, different than uh, most of uh, vineyards you find in Napa Valley. There are mountain vineyards, of course, we know that. But this sort of uh, hidden valley is just incredible place. And I think, I think they make incredible wines that harken back to the great uh, Napa wines of the 50s, 40s, things like BV, Inglenook, amazing old wines. So uh, it should be exciting to get a handle on exactly what Promontory is doing. It's not a concept wine like some of uh, highly touted wines from Napa. This is a, a purely terroir driven wine with very unique characteristics coming from a unique place. So Will, Will tell us all about it. Happy to. And um, again, thank you all for, for joining us today. I wish we could do this in person. And I look forward to the next opportunity to come out to, to Hong Kong and visit you all. But um, in the meantime, <clears throat> I think we've all gotten uh, a little bit used to this, so I'm happy to just provide a little bit of uh, context here for this project. So, you know, my family's been in the wine business here in Napa Valley for uh, almost 40 years. And uh, even though Prom uh, Promontory is our most recent wine growing endeavor, the, the roots of this uh, story actually go all the way back to uh, even before Harlan Estate. And it was in the early 1980s when my father was originally uh, hiking through the western hills of Oakville, looking for land, uh, vineyard land for, for Harlan Estate, that he discovered this place. And uh, it's actually quite close in proximity to, to Harlan Estate. <clears throat> um, and at the time, this was all wilderness. It was all forest. And it was just by chance that he was hiking along the ridge line and came a little bit further south than he had been before. And he found this place that um, was completely hidden from the rest of Napa Valley, even though it was very close to the, the heart of, of, of the Napa Valley. And it, this, this place, you know, it moved him deeply. And he felt if he you know, if he could somehow figure out how to capture it, he felt that would have great potential. And so he actually tried to purchase uh, this property that we see in front of us here. Um, here, actually, the view that we have is at the northern end of the property looking south, and you can actually see the Napa Valley out through the little gap on the left-hand side of the screen. Um, you know, this this place moved him deeply, and he, he, he was working on, on purchasing it, but the the, the owners were not interested in, in selling the property. At the time, it was undeveloped, it was only forest, and they were using it as a hunting uh, kind of uh, land, and, and they, it, so it was completely natural. So we weren't able to capture it then, but in 2008, uh, we, were, we, we got a call, a phone call from a friend of ours, letting us know that this property was finally going to be on the market. And if we were interested, we should get in early and, you know, uh, capture it before it came, came on the market. And this is when, you know, I, I first started to spend some time out there. And um, it was, you know, it was fascinating. It, here's a place so close to Harlan Estate, and yet I had never known that, that it existed. And um, so, it, you know, it's, it, it's still, even to this day, extremely wild, very rugged, very steep. Um, and there's only certain, you know, pockets of, of the property that are, uh, that are gradual enough to plant vines on. Um, and by the time I was walking around there with Corey Emting, our, our director of wine growing, 
um, you know, the place this 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 land had actually been planted over the last uh, few decades with a little bit of vineyard. So by the time we were walking uh, on the property in 2008, there were already uh, about 32 hectares of, of vineyards, but they did not plant it with the intent of producing fine wine. For the most part, they were just selling fruit to other growers. And so when we when we discovered this place, it was almost like coming across a forgotten garden. It was very overgrown, not very well maintained, and uh, but had this feeling of being very, very wild. <laughs> and so anyway, we had to figure out in a very short period of time whether or not we were going to purchase this property because we weren't sure exactly what we might do with it. We felt it had uh, a great potential and we did all of the soil analysis and, and, and you know, everything told us that this should be very good vineyard land. Um, but at the same time, it was very different and we didn't know yet why it was so different. Um, we made those discoveries later, but um, we decided to purchase the property uh, without a clear idea of what we were going to do with it. And um, and so we started making wine that first year from the existing vines just to just to learn about this place. And we did that for the first few years with in a temporary winery. We made the wine, we bottled it. And over the course of that, we started making some very important discoveries, not just about you know, the, the character of the wine, which ended up being very different than, than Harlan Estate, but also very different than anything else we had experienced in Napa Valley. But before we get into that, I thought it might be helpful to just uh, provide a little bit of an orientation to where exactly uh, this land is. So we've got a, a map of um, Napa Valley here. This gives you a sense of, you know, Promontory, the, the purple area that you see there, straddling um, this kind of the western hills of Oakville and Yauntville. And, um, but, you know, yeah, perfect. We zoom in a little bit and you can see we have the purple area, which is the vineyard land for Promontory, the purple star, which is actually where the winery is today. And then in between those, we have Harlan Estate. And so just, it gives you this, this uh, a certain level of um, context for the proximity of these places. And so um, we also have a drone video that we've taken that is leaving from the winery, flying over Harlan Estate and into the promontory uh, territory. So we're leaving the winery. And um, is it smooth for you, James, the, the video? It's smooth enough. Smooth enough. Okay. Yeah, it's a little bit. Uh, okay, okay, there we go. I think it's, okay, perfect. So we're flying over Harlan Estate here. And um, you can see, you know, off to the left, you have Napa Valley. Up to the right, we have the hills, the western hills of Oakville. This was taken on. Um, kind of an, an early spring morning, but you can see that, you know, throughout this area, the majority of this land is still very, very wild. And um, it, it's actually quite lush. It's a very different than the Eastern side of Napa Valley. And this was, this was important to us. And this, there's a reason that we chose these Western Hills, not only for Harlan Estate, but also for Promontory, is we have much higher moisture content um, just by virtue of being surrounded by forests, but also we have slopes that face the east. And so we have the morning sun without the, the afternoon sun. So it ends up being much cooler. And uh, this is actually a wonderful view. You can kind of see these wisps of fog coming up off of the forest. This is what we call radiation fog, which is when the sun warms up the, the moisture that is you know, condensed on the trees uh, throughout the night. And this almost creates its own um, uh, kind of weather event. So here we're coming down into promontory. We're coming through the clouds, coming into the northern end of the property, very similar to that initial uh, photograph that you saw at the beginning. And uh, 
you can see the left hand ridge line that's what shields this property from view from the rest of napa valley this is why no one knew that this place existed um, and then you can see, you know, we have these little pockets of vineyard. Everything that you see under vine is, is within the promontory, uh, what we call the territory. So it's these pockets of vineyard, these islands of vineyard throughout the forest um, that we almost have our own complete little world here um, on, on the borderlands of, of Oakville and Yonville. So you know, as we started applying our learnings and our expertise and, and, and experience from Harlan Estate, we thought that, okay, we'll just take that and we'll take that approach to farming and we'll, we'll do that same thing over at Promontory. That didn't work. And so we had to go through this process of unlearning everything that we had learned at Harlan Estate and developing a new approach to farming that would fit this, this property. So um, again, very exciting for us, but also a, a little bit scary. And, um, you know, we, we, we tracked this through the wines and, and it took us a while to understand why the wines were so different, but it really came down to at its core, this, this metamorphic material. And I can speak to kind of really what that, what we feel that that's brought out in the wines, but there are other aspects in, in answer to your question that kind of set promontory apart. The fact that, the property itself, more than 90% of the property is still forest. And these vineyards are completely surrounded. They're just little islands of vineyard throughout the, the forest. And so the forest plays a huge role, not just in kind of having a cooling effect and, and an increased moisture effect, um, but also in terms of the the just the the the, the smell of the air and the notes that it that it brings and that that I think you feel. In, in many senses in the wine. Um, here's, here's a kind of a wonderful shot of just a, a, a small island kind of within, within the forest here. But, um, you know, in, in Napa Valley, it's very different than, than in, in Europe. It's very dry throughout the growing season. We don't have rain. And so, um, so when we have, even in the summer months, this is a time-lapse video of a summer day in august where you know from 10 a.m to 1 p.m we have this fog that moves throughout the property and the shape of the property having these very steep hills and this opening to the northeast and an opening to the south we have a constant movement of air and when we have this radiation fog coming up from the forest it creates this swirling um, effect and we have this moisture that brings just so much more freshness to uh, the wine growing environment and helps the vines throughout these very dry, warm, uh, and, and can be stressful months uh, throughout the growing season that we, we just don't have any rain. So this is another really important aspect of what makes um, promontory uh, promontory. Um, and so, so <clears throat> that's all of, very very unique particularly for napa valley and and then you know how does that translate then into the wine one thing i do notice is that you pick a little bit later than people but not because you're going for big um ripe style but i assume because of the slightly cooler climate but um what is what is the different soils at the higher altitude and this cooling effect of the forest what effect does that have for example, on the um, phenolics in the grape, the tannin content, and what does that mean for you guys? I mean, it's sort of a rhetorical question because you've told me before, but it's actually really interesting. Yeah, no, it, it's um, it, because it is a little bit cooler, um, it, it kind of lengthens our, our picking window. And so we've actually started, um, started harvest probably a little bit earlier, but promontory because of just how diverse it is, does extend a little bit longer. But, um, you know, at the end of the day, the notes and the, the, the core shape texturally that we get from this place tends to be much more uh, of a, you know, maybe a, a mineral driven expression of Cabernet rather than a fruit driven expression. And, but more interesting, I think, is, is structurally speaking, and this gets into more of our aging regime as well, which I'll talk to next. But 
Um, with Promontory, we recognized from a very early stage that the quality of tannin was extremely high and extremely fine. Uh, but it was when it was young, it was like a rock. It was almost impenetrable. Um, but once it started to slowly relax, you had this structure that that had a feeling, almost an almost weightless feeling to it, which which to us was just so so different and so special. And we wanted to do everything in our power to um, to to be true to that and not in any way um, you know cover that up. And so this this kind of mineral drive, this focus, and and I think this this feeling of an almost weightless structure is really what promontory is about. You know, you get this wet stone, you get this um, rather than maybe the forest floor and moss that you have with Harlan Estate, you have more of the forest canopy and lichen and things like this in terms of the notes that you have with with promontory. Um, so. You know, because of the nature of, you know, the structure, the tannins of promontory, we, we really felt that we needed to have a different approach, not only from our farming and our viticulture with promontory, but also with our aging and winemaking. And, you know, with, with, with our elevation, which is between about um, 150 meters and 300 meters. So it's not like the mountain wines that you hear of in Spring Mountain or Mount Veeder. It's kind of still in this tenderloin area just off, off the floor of the valley. But we, we have this structure and we wanted to find a way for this to resolve and relax and, and, and um, in a very natural way. And so, again, we didn't want to, to cover this up or, or round anything. We wanted it to just stay very, very pure. And so, Corey really felt that um, going and visiting some of these other producers that aged for longer, in particular in Northern Italy and Piemonte, you know, these Barolos and things, he had a specific producer um, in, in Conterno in particular that, that he, he, he consulted on the, the vessels that he used. And so he settled on this Austrian uh, producer of casks, Austrian oak being much more neutral than French oak, very aromatically, um, uh, very aromatically neutral. And uh, this would allow us to age promontory for longer. And so that we could use time to help the wine relax rather than necessarily the interaction with wood. And so these are um, large, you know, between 15 to 32 hectoliter uh, Austrian oak uh, casks. And we work with now a few different coopers, but uh, we were the first to, to start working with Franz Stockinger in the United States. This, this really allowed us this this luxury of time and and this is why promontory is aged for four years instead of you know 20 months or you know 24 months or 30 months and so each vintage you know we we really celebrate you know the differences and and what makes each vintage each vintage and we know that every vintage will probably need a certain maybe a different amount of time in cask and so with this release cycle we have that that kind of luxury of being able to decide exactly how much time each vintage spends in cask versus when we bottle. So, and and one thing I, um, I never asked was so I I understand the aging and the inspiration from Giacomo Conterna, um, which also ages five, six, seven years his um, Monfortina. But uh, what what about as far as the winemaking? You go for shorter. Uh, macerations and um, and a slightly cooler temperature. What what what's the what's the? No, you, you your memory serves you correctly. And um, you know, with, with Promontory, we realized after the first handful of vintages that um, we needed to be very very gentle with our extraction. The material was all there. And it was such good quality. It, it took a lot of self control to say, "Okay, we don't need to. We don't need to get all of that. There's 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 this balance that we need to find." And and a lot of that had to do with um, dialing back, uh, you know, uh, macerations in terms of length and and cooling things down. 
And, um, you know, it's a perfect example of how we've just, you know, really tailored things specifically for, um, for this place. Okay. And, um, and so now the first vintage was 09. Now that you're, you know, you're on to the current releases, is, is it 16 or 15 now? So the 15 is our current release. The 16 uh, will be available really at the early part of next year. Okay. So this is quite honestly, you're, you're pretty much the first people to try the 2016 <laughs> because, um, you know, we haven't been able to travel out in the world. And this is the first masterclass that we've done with the 2016 vintage. So this is really exciting for me to be able to, you know, speak to this um not just with with you james as a critic but with um you know a, 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 a wonderful audience here so um 2000 we we did actually make a 2008 vintage that we never released um if you come visit us at the winery which i hope uh, all of you do then i'd be happy to uh, to pull some bottles of, of the 08 but uh 09 was the first vintage that that we actually sold 09, 10, and 11 were all so small that we just had enough for our private allocation. Um, 2012, the reason that we're starting with 2012 today is that that was the first vintage that we released really on, on the market. Well, uh, do you want to go ahead and start uh, start tasting then? Sure. Yeah. You okay if, if we taste oldest to youngest? Um, yeah, absolutely. I, I think it's I think it's much better to go um, oldest to youngest, and that's what I do generally. To so you can really see the evolution of winemaking and everything, and it's a great way to really understand, you know, the history of uh, of a, a winery or a, of a particular wine. Also, I wanted to point out that um, whenever I see the the large casks in your winery, I always think back to those days. Uh, as a young man visiting Napa in the 80s and visiting places like BV, uh, Boyu Vineyards, and meeting Andre Chalichuk. And they were still aging like private reserve and upright large um, casks. So there's sort Probably of Redwood, like, Redwood casks. <laughs> yeah, Redwood, exactly. And isn't that cool? So, in a way, you're really going back to the history of Napa and using large format wood and aging it longer like th they used to do it three or four years so i think it's it's actually really interesting just you know a uh, re-experiencing history in winemaking at napa no it's a it's a great point and maybe the 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 single distinction i'll make is that you know it's we we recognize that this actually is what is best for promontory. The yeah. fact that it's how we made things back in the day is actually really cool and I love it. And it's yeah. part of the history of Napa Valley, but there is a distinction I think between doing something the way that they used to just for the sake of doing it, you know, yeah. historically versus, you know, for us, it's really, we just, it just so happens to be the right thing for promontory. And maybe it's, maybe it's just that, you know, that our elders were wiser than we are today, <laughs> which is probably true. And uh, we're just now figuring it out. How would you just, how would you describe the, the uh, 2012 now? And, and I don't see, you see no wood character of any sort in my mind, just the purity of fruit and also the ripeness of the 2012 vintage. You know, it was, it, it was a riper year and made slightly fruit forward wines but this isn't like a big wine it's more linear but it has a really nice composition of just pure fruit and the tannins are just paint across the palate no I, I i really agree with you i think the 12 is in a wonderful place and and you know 12 was a very benevolent vintage in napa valley it's just like kind of easy going you know not not a lot of hardship and um, it produced a wine, as you say, that that was quite fruit forward, quite typical of, of Napa in a lot of ways. But even when it was young, it had a certain roundness, certain softness, very genteel. You know, in, in a lot of ways, it was pretty different than a lot of the, the, the concepts that you think about with Promontory. But I think at this point, you, you start to feel the layers, uh, a certain velvety kind of texture, I think, okay. of, of the 12, which... Um, 
it, you know, it's really coming into its own, but it's, it's going to be a versatile vintage. It's going to show well, I think, um, for a long time. And it was, a, it was always, at least when I tasted it, even in the beginning, it's always been like that, this wine where the, those velvety tannins just spread across the palate and it's just really wonderfully balanced. That's why I gave it a hundred, you know, a hundred points in the beginning. It was just, it was just perfection for the vintage. No, thank you. Thank you very much. I, I think you're right. I think of all the vintages of Promontory, it does, it, it, it is a bit broader. And uh, whereas, you know, the rest of the wines that we'll taste tonight, today, uh, we'll, we'll have a much more kind of linear and, and kind of focused element to them. But the, the, the 12 just, it is, it's wonderful. And, and it has a, a lovely roundness to it. So let's um, tell us how 13, um was diff different to 12 then yeah in so yeah. 13 were one extra year into a drought and so very very little rainfall the previous winter <clears throat> and so the yields were quite low um so the berries already were quite small and uh on top of that 13 was a year we don't have a lot of wind in napa valley but in 13 we had quite a bit of wind and we felt that contributed to a thickening of the skins of already small berries. And so the extractable tannin available to us in that vintage was just at a, at a different level. And we had to be very careful with our, with our extraction to not overdo it. Even so we're left with, I mean, really a wine that um, is, I mean, the stature of, of the 13 is one that I think will carry it into uh maybe a lifetime uh, as long as mine you know <laughs> like this is going to be a long-lived wine it may not be as um uh as approachable in its youth as the 12 but uh this is a wine that honestly i feel is just so, has a wonderful balance wonderful harmony uh very very kind of solid uh, acidity and and it's just it's built for the long haul and if you have the patience it's really going to reward that and this one this one in particular shows more of the character that you described earlier like the influence of the forest with sort of conifer pine needles it's my uh, wet earth it really smells like just walking through you know the vineyards of uh promontory it's really just it's really really clear like that yeah from here on out really with the rest of the vintages you get more and more every vintage you get more of this kind of feeling of the forest this coolness this um this stone and and, and minerality uh but you're right the 13 has that in in, yeah. in stage so but so how about 14 that that's a a little bit, uh, let's say, forgotten vintage, because then people were more thinking about 15 and 16, but I always liked the balance to it. Yeah, 14 has, for us, it was always an interesting story because um, as, as I mentioned, we're, we're still in this drought and it was a five-year drought and all the way through 2015. So 14, further along in this drought, very little rainfall. And as I mentioned before, even in a low year, even in a high year rainfall, we don't have rain during the growing season itself. So by the end of the summer, like the vines are, are feeling it, they're feeling the stress and the struggle. But in 14, we had a phenomenon um, that was uh, quite surprising. Um, we had an earthquake that occurred in August uh, that the epicenter was actually in that valley. And it was a it was a fairly severe earthquake to where uh, many wineries lost a lot of uh, wine in barrel. We actually lost um, a dozen or so barrels of, of finished wine between you know Harlan Estate and Bond and things, uh, which was quite sad. And it's a big cleanup uh, process. None of the barrels were where we left them. They were all just like kind of all over the place. Um, but what it did, and this is something that we had no idea was even possible was you know all all the little creeks and rivers and streams by that time of year in august are usually dry 
And what happened was this earthquake was severe enough that it shifted the water table un, you know, deep within the, the, the earth. And so all of a sudden these streams and the springs started flowing again. And just, I mean, out of nowhere, the grass turned green again. And it was like, you know, this kind of miracle thing. But we felt that this provided the vines with, uh, with kind of a renewed energy and, and vigor. And um, it kind of just gave them a little refreshment. And I think you feel that in the 14. It has this flow. I, more than any other wine that we produce from Prom Promontor, it's just so dynamic, and the movement is constant throughout the uh, throughout the palate. So it it's always had this flow, this really bright and and quite, I mean, honestly, still very primary wine in a lot of ways. Um, but and this was that a phenomena just for Promontor, or did it happen at Harlan as well, or Bond? We saw it more at Promontory. But we did see this happen at uh, at Prom at uh, Harlan Estate as well. Okay. Um, I think because Promontory has these two fault lines, it's just so geologically kind of predisposed to be active um, that it just it, it kind of had an outsized effect there. It's interesting to taste it now, where you see some of that pure fruit of the of the 12, but then the structure of the 13 and has a lot of tension, but it's actually pretty um, tight at the finish, you know, like yeah. you, it's easier to drink than the 13, but this has a long life ahead of it as well. No, I agree. And, and, you know, what, what, what you, what you're mentioning there is something that we find as well, this kind of feeling that it's tightening at the finish is kind of this idea yeah. that it's focusing in usually Cabernet, you know, on the attack, it starts small and then it broadens out. Promontory has this effect of almost like streamlining towards the finish. And uh, 14, I think, with the with the flow and the fluidity really captures that. Really gorgeous one. Okay, so then we go to 15, yet again, a really uh, dry and hot year with some mega heat spikes. And... Uh, it was pretty crazy. I was there, um, but actually, the, it's a, you know most of the wines came out really nicely. They don't really show, you know, big high alcohol. I think a lot of people understood what to do, um, how to handle uh, the heat and dryness. But of course, you guys are up in um, <clears throat> promontory. So, tell us about your experience up there with this year. Yeah. So, fifteen um was was an interesting year for sure so it was the fifth year of a drought so at this point our volumes i mean the, the volumes are very low um and we you know at, at promontory we, we we've got to the point of dry farming almost the entirety of the property and um yeah 15 was i mean i wish we could have made more of 15 because it ended up being a, really a wonderful wine and and for reasons that we could not have predicted um we actually had a, a very very cool start to the season uh, we were lucky that it didn't affect uh flowering and we, we didn't have to to deal with shatter or anything but um it was important because usually when you have a cool start to the season you also have rain but we didn't we didn't have rain uh in 2015 so Cool beginnings. And then towards the end, we did. We had the warmth. We felt the sunlight and things. And and sometimes when you have these, these elements together, you have a, a wine that's a little bit disjointed. It feels a little bit hot, but also maybe unripe. Um, but because we were in this severe drought and we didn't have rain, we didn't get that vegetative vigor going on. And so we have almost the opposite, where you have a nose that, that reminds you of the beginning of the season it has this freshness this coolness and then on the palate you have a certain generosity and this softness that reminds you of kind of the warmer end of the season and they actually work really really nicely together um this was uh, one of the more pleasant surprises for us um with this vintage because you know it was it was very small and, and unexpected but um the other interesting thing about the 15 vintage is that it was the first vintage that we made in the, the new winery. 
all the previous vintages we were making in a temporary facility while we were building uh, the new winery. Again, I hope you all come and visit us at some point. Um, and maybe the final point with the 15 is that um, the 15 and actually the 14, both were the first vintages to be aged completely in the Austrian oak casks. So the 12 and 13, you know, the 12 was aged in Barrique, 13 was a transition year, 14 was almost entirely in the casks, and then 15 was the first vintage that the whole thing, uh, all the wine was aged in the Austrian oak. Uh -huh. That's really interesting. Huh. Wow. Then you definitely see a more purity of fruit, but like you say, Stockinger is pretty neutral oak and and also i think in interestingly both white and red wines it really seems to emphasize perfumes and like the 15 the aromas i see my first note i wrote a few years ago and i'm like insane aromas and it still has this incredible aromas to it of flowers and fruits and it's just so gorgeous you could just yeah, you wouldn't expect stop. that out of a drought year. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And it's not red fruits that you normally get out of a hot and drought year, right? It has blue fruits. Yeah. So cool. Yeah, I, th I think the floral nature, the aromatics of the 15 were the things that that just kind of kept us going. When even when we were just you know hesitant in terms of wow how is this wine going to end up we always went back to the aromatics because usually promontory is quite quiet it's very it's a very quiet wine aromatically in its youth but the 15 was the first one that just and i i think you're right i think a lot of it is the 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 austrian oak almost allows these elements to shine through without being maybe uh, uh affected by the notes that come from a, a french oak or something like that yeah. but um, you, you really feel this detail aromatically. So amazing. Okay, now we get uh, to the 16, which, you know, structured wines, more like 13, but, but maybe pure fruit. And um, it's going to be great to taste this. I cannot um, wait to introduce this to the world, in all honesty. Yeah, thanks for that. And, and tell us a little bit about uh, the, the vintage up there, how, how did it go, the growing season? So the winter before the 16, we finally got rain. So after five years of drought, we finally had a very, very healthy um, rainfall going into the 2016 vintage. Um, other than that, the thing that I remember most about this year was that there were no hot days. I mean, it was, we had sunshine, nice warm temperatures, um, but nothing, I mean, nothing, almost nothing over 95 degrees. Usually we have, you know, a dozen days over a hundred. And uh, I think maybe there was uh, three or four days that got over 95 degrees. I'm, I apologize. I'm not, I, I can never remember it if you deal more in Celsius, but um, I don't know my conversions well enough to help you out, but um Anyway, so very even, I mean, the most moderate season that we've had from a temperature perspective that I can remember. And um, combined with this, this uh, wintertime rain, I mean, it set the stage for, I think, one of the, one of the great vintages in, in Napa Valley. And I, I, feel like, I feel like you feel this in, this, in the 2016. I feel like this is, you know, I, I can speak to the minerality and promontory and and maybe this wet stone in the previous vintages but in 2016 is when all of these things converge and you can just see them all just kind of you know hitting on all cylinders um this wine really i think is 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 a wonderful example of um not just the vintage but also like our learnings up until then and uh it, it helped that we that it was our you know it was our eighth vintage um as well and the, again the purity of fruit and the <clears throat> tightness and it almost doesn't seem full bodied it's it's sort of now even more medium bodied and what's interesting i think that that's a good sign 
is I haven't tasted it for, I think since January, 2020. And now it, it's even seems like tighter, which all the great classic wines, let's say of Bordeaux, like the tour and wines like that, they get, you know, they close down a bit and that's a really amazing sign. Yet it's not at all aggressive. It's just incredibly um, full of harmony. What an amazing pure wine. I and the team both are, are very proud of this vintage. And, you know, of the things that set Promontory apart from anything that we've worked on before, I think this shows um, this concept of uh, kind of, the, kind of the, the feeling of an almost weightless structure. I mean, the, the 16 yeah. kind of captures this feeling and it's what you said it's like it's almost like it's medium bodied it's it's almost yeah. you feel this transparency and almost a translucency you feel the light in in this more than the warmth of the sun you, we feel the light of the sun in in this glass each of these wines that we've tasted today are on a, tra a trajectory they're on an arc of course there's vintage variation and personality that we love we celebrate the vintage but texturally speaking there is a consistent arc. And this is, this is something that we continue through 17, through 18. Um, 18 look, yeah, 18 is going to be an incredible way. Um, and it is so ethereal. I mean, it is just uh, this, this, this almost delicate kind of lace-like wine. And I cannot, I, look, I look forward to, to tasting with you. And how and how's it looking this year, 2021? Hey, 20, 2021 is good, and we don't have any fires. We just had a lightning storm run through last night, but we're very fortunate that uh, no fires started. Um, 2021 is going to be small because we have we've had so little rainfall the last few years. Um, we knew it was going to be small going into it, but it's ended up being even smaller in terms of volume. But on the flip side, the quality is is really unbelievable. So we at least have have that to 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 fall back on. OK, well, listen, well, thanks so much for staying up and um, taking us through this fantastic tasting. Uh, it was really, you know, the wine showed wonderfully. Uh, Makes me a bit homesick. I miss my house in St. Helena. But uh, anyways, we'll catch up. And the wines just showed wonderfully today. Really, they lived Thanks. up to all their expectations. Um, and, you know, I think that everyone can appreciate better this unique wine called Promontory. And I hope that all of you can get out there one day to Napa and check it out. It's really off the charts place. And just go for a hike there or something. I've been telling Will that it's an incredible place to hike to. So come on by, let us know. Anyways, Will, thanks again for the tasting. I don't know, 100 round of applause. Thank you. <laughs> we'll catch up soon. Thanks All right, again. Sounds good. Cheers. Cheers. Bye. Bye.